Hello and welcome to the 2600 video. My name is Jordan Rudis from Kurzweil. I'm also the keyboardist for the group Dream Theater. The purpose of this video is to give you a basic overview of your new instrument and to get you up and running quickly. We'll cover some basic programming, create a sequence, and look at the major operational areas. This video is not intended to be a substitute for your manual. In fact, you may find it helpful to pause the video and refer to your manual as you watch. You'll also find it helpful if you watch the video if you're next to your 2600, so you can follow along on your own instrument. I also recommend that if you have access to the internet, that you visit our website at www.youngchang.com slash Kurzweil. If you look in the customer support area on the site, you'll find many answers to many of the frequently asked questions, plus tutorials and other reference information. The video has been broken up into sections. To help you find these various sections, a number will be displayed in the upper left-hand corner so you can fast forward to areas that most interest you. These numbers also correspond with the chapter titles printed on the video box. So let's get started. First, we'll give you a quick overview of the instrument. Looking at the front panel, you will notice that it is divided into sections. To the left of the display, or under the display in the case of the rack, is a row of eight buttons. Pressing these buttons takes you to the 2600's eight operational modes. The names of the modes are printed in white. Underneath, or to the side of this, you will notice that the buttons also have a blue label, and some of the buttons have an orange label. When you're editing a program and are in the program editor, then the blue labels apply to these buttons. When you're editing a sample within the sample editor, the orange labels apply. If you have the keyboard, then you also have three extra buttons under the mode buttons. These are dedicated to the sequencer, allowing you to start, stop, pause, and record, no matter which mode is currently shown in the display. Directly under the display is a row of eight buttons. The edit and exit buttons are used to enter and exit the various editors found in the different modes. The middle six buttons are called soft buttons because their function changes according to where you are in the software menus. You'll notice six blocks at the bottom of the display. The blocks change names in relation to the function displayed on the screen. For instance, when you first turn on the 2600, you're in the program mode, and the soft buttons are used to transpose by octave, change MIDI channels, change the way programs are displayed, or send a MIDI all notes off message. If you have a rack version of the 2600 and just tried pressing these buttons, you may have noticed that pressing the octave plus or minus buttons had no effect. Don't worry, this is normal. We'll explain about this in just a moment. To the left of the display are the channel bank buttons. Although these buttons have different functions depending on which mode you're in, they always work in the same manner. When there are multiple pages which show the same thing, they'll move you through those pages. For example, in program and several other modes, they'll switch you through the 16 MIDI channels. In quick access mode, they switch to the different quick access banks. In song mode, they switch record tracks. And if you're editing programs or setups, then the green label under the button applies, switching you through layers in a program or zones in a setup. To the right of the display are buttons used for navigating and data entry. The four arrow buttons move the cursor around in the various edit screens and also scroll through programs and setups when in those modes. The wheel and the plus and minus buttons are used to scroll through the values of the various parameters. And the numeric keypad is used to directly enter specific values. If you have the keyboard, then you also have a section marked Assignable Controllers. There are eight sliders with eight buttons above them. The sliders can be used for real-time control of virtually any aspect of the sound. The sliders also have a special function when playing a KB3 program. KB3 programs are special programs which model the way a real Hammond B3 organ works. In this case, the eight sliders work just like drawbars in a real Hammond, and the mod wheel is the ninth drawbar. The 
buttons above the sliders have different uses, depending on where you are in the instrument. When you're playing a KB3 program, then the labels above the buttons apply, allowing you to do things like turning on percussion, vibrato, and the rotary effect. In setup mode, the buttons will light for each zone used in the current setup. The light will be green if the zone is currently active. If you press a button, it will mute that zone and the light turns orange. You can easily change timbres by using these buttons. If you create a setup with many zones, you can quickly change your sound by simply muting and unmuting various zones to create different combinations. The sliders can be used to send any kind of controller message. As you play through the preset programs and setups, make sure to move the sliders to hear the variations you can create in the sound. To the left of the sliders is a button marked Solo. This will solo the currently selected zone. The first time you press the button, it will solo zone one. The zone button light will turn red. You can then solo any zone by pressing its button. Here I have layered three different sounds. By pressing the solo button, I can move back and forth between the different sounds and quickly switch my soloing sound. Below the solo button is the mix down button. This page lets you use the sliders to easily send MIDI volume or pan messages when you're working on a song. The third button on the left is called MIDI faders. This page allows you to create a preset configuration of any controller number assignment for each slider, along with an initial preset value for that controller. For each slider, you can assign the MIDI channel, controller number, and value. You can enter the value manually or use the slider to set the value. You can set several sliders to the same channel, but have each one assigned to a different controller number. There are four different configurations, which are called up by the soft buttons. Each configuration remembers the last value you set for each slider. If you want to send those values without moving the slider, press the Send button. Now let's talk about the other physical controllers on the keyboard. One of the first things you notice about the K2600 is the large ribbon controller placed above the keyboard. The ribbon senses movement when you press on it and when you move your finger up or down. The ribbon can be used as a single long strip, or if you want, it can be divided into three separate zones, each program to do something different. These zones are indicated by the two smaller arrows above the strip. There also is one large arrow directly to the center of the strip to give you a visual indication of the center point when you're using the ribbon as one long strip. One typical way you might use the ribbon is to bend pitch. This works especially great for lead programs. <laughs> You will also notice a small ribbon controller located below the wheels. This ribbon is both pressure and movement sensitive, so it will respond to both my finger moving from side to side and from pressing down. You can program this ribbon so that it sends the same controller message for both pressure and movement, or you can program different messages. In this setup, I have the small ribbon set so that by pressing on it, I can control the amplitude, and by moving my finger back and forth, I can alter the pitch. This allows me to create a vibrato with the same type of technique that a string player would.
The two wheels are typical of what is found on many keyboards. The left one is normally used for pitch bend and springs back to center, while the right wheel is normally used as a standard mod wheel. Above the wheels are two buttons. These buttons can be set to momentary so that they are only on while you press them, or they can be set to toggle so that each time you press the button it turns on or off. In our preset programs and setups, they are often used to turn the arpeggiator on and off and to change effects. Now let's look at the back of the instrument. You will find the typical power, MIDI, SCSI, and audio connections, along with the KDS port, which is used to connect to the optional DMTI using Kurzweil's proprietary digital format. There's also a knob for changing the display contrast. If you have the sampling option, you will see analog and digital sample input and digital output connectors. For keyboard owners, you will also see jacks for plugging in four switch pedals two continuous controller pedals and a breath controller. We'll be showing some examples of using these controllers later in the video. Let's take a moment to talk about the audio outs. You will see there are 10 configured as pairs labeled mix, A, B, C, and D. It's important to understand that even though there are 10 jacks, there are only eight routable outs. Here's the way it works. When you route a signal, you choose the A, B, C, or D pairs in the appropriate panning position. For the purposes of following along with this video, you should have two cables plugged into either the mix outs or the A pair. I'll be explaining how to use multiple outs in the section on effects, so if you want to try that, you should plug cables into the A, B, C, and D pairs of outputs. Now let's jump in and start playing. We'll assume you know how to hook up MIDI in audio. If you aren't in program mode, go there by pressing the program button. If you have a rack, make sure your keyboard is transmitting on channel 1. Then check the upper right hand corner of the 2600's display to see that it is on channel 1. If not, you can change it by using the channel bank buttons or the channel plus or minus soft buttons. By default, you will see the programs displayed as a list on the right side of the screen. You press the Master button, then the View button. You can switch the display to a larger view. If you go back to the program mode, you will see just one program name displayed in the large letters. This can be useful if you're performing on stage and want to see the program name from a distance. For now, Let's return to this, the display to the regular list view. To scroll through different programs, you can use the wheel, the arrow buttons, or the plus and minus buttons. You can also call up a specific program by typing its number and pressing enter. As you explore our preset programs, make sure to move the sliders in the mod wheel. You will find that we have programmed them so that all eight sliders and the wheel will change some aspect of the sound. In general, the first four sliders and the wheel will change programming parameters, while the last four will change effect parameters. For example, in program 80, which is Poly Real Mini, Slider A adds resonance to the filter. Slider B controls the filter cutoff. Slider C controls the attack time. Slider D controls release time and treble EQ.
slider E controls the wet, dry mix of the reverb. Slider F controls the decay time of the reverb. Slider G controls the amount of pre-delay in the reverb. And slider H controls the amount of the chorus delay effect. As you can see, by moving the sliders, you can have tremendous control over your sound. You will also want to try the mod wheel and the two buttons above it. In this program, the mod wheel adds vibrato. Switch button one turns on the arpeggiator. And switch two increases the amount of echo in the chorus delay effect. If you try this on your own keyboard and find that the sliders do not do the same things for this program that I have just described, go to the MIDI mode and check the control setup parameter on the MIDI transmit page. Make sure it's set to number 97, which is also called control setup. I'll talk more about this parameter later, but for now, just make sure it's set to number 97. As you scroll through the programs, you will find some with a caret character in between two names. For these programs, slider A will switch between two different sounds. For example, in program 74, with slider A down, you will hear new mutes, and with it up, you'll hear Watt Tower. <laughs> Also, in most of our presets, slider E will control the overall wet-dry mix of the effects. For those of you who have the rack, if your keyboard doesn't have any assignable controllers, you may want to consider getting an extra controller, such as the PV1600, which is assignable sliders, giving you the ability to send MIDI controller messages. If the Kurzweil is at its default settings, then slider 1 is assigned to MIDI controller number 6, and sliders 2 through 8 are set to controllers 22 through 28. A complete list of the preset programs and how control sources affect them is printed in the K2600 reference manual. There are actually four different types of programs, although two types are very similar. Regular programs can have up to three layers, and the left side of the display will show the name of the key map for each layer. Programs which have between four and 32 layers are called drum programs, but they do not have to have drum sounds in them. They can be made of any sound, but we call these programs drum programs because that is the typical use for a program with a lot of layers. When you scroll to a drum program, the left side of the display will show this and tell you how many layers there are in the program. Other than the number of layers, drum programs function identically to regular programs. The third type of program is entirely different. These are called KB3 programs, and they are special programs which emulate the way a real B3 organ works. You will find these programs between programs number 750 and 769. When you call up these programs, the sliders in the mod wheel function differently than they do for regular programs. The eight sliders function like the first eight drawbars on a B3, and the mod wheel functions as the ninth drawbar, just like on a real organ. Moving the sliders down towards you brings up the volume for that partial, and pushing it up brings the volume down, which is the opposite of the way a slider would typically be programmed in a synthesizer. The only exception to this is the mod wheel, which still works the same, adding volume as you bring up the mod wheel. The buttons above the sliders access other standard B3 functions, such as adding percussion and turning on the chorus vibrato effect.
One thing to be aware of with KB3 programs is that in order to emulate the way a real organ works, the Kurzweil grabs a specific number of voices as soon as you call up the KB3 program, and those voices are reserved for the KB3 program, whether or not you're playing any notes. You can determine the number of voices used by setting the number of tone wheels in the program when you edit it. All of the preset KB3 programs are designed so that they use 40 of your 48 voices of polyphony. So typically, when you're using a KB3 program, you'll probably be playing it by itself, or maybe split in a setup with a bass program. But you should not expect to be able to sequence with a KB3 program and have a lot of polyphony left for other tracks. The fourth kind of program is a live mode program. To use live mode, you must first have the sampling option and sample RAM installed in your instrument. Live mode programs are actually just like regular VAST programs, with one exception. Instead of using the preset ROM samples, or samples you load into RAM for the source of the sound, you can process anything that comes into the sample input through both the VAST synthesis engine and the effects. This allows you to use the Kurzweil as a real-time synth and effects processor for external signals. To use live mode, you first need to have something plugged into an analog sample input. I'm going to be using a guitar. Next, you need to turn live mode on. Press the sample mode soft button. Make sure that the source is set to external and input is set to analog. Now, scroll down to the mode and set it to live in. Now you can use the gain parameter to adjust the amount of input signal. The sample input on the K2600 is line level, so if you're running a signal from a microphone or a guitar, you'll either want to run it into a preamp or mixer first, or else bring the gain parameter up. You will find the preset live mode programs located between 740 and 749. I'll call up program 746, which is live mode paraflange. So I have the guitar running through a parametric EQ, which I can control with slider A, and the mod wheel, and a flange effect, which I can control with slider B. In order for a live mode program to actually send the live input through the Kurzweil, you have to strike a note on the keyboard. So I'll strike C4 and hold it with the sustain pedal. Here's another example using a tube distortion. The 2600 is 16 channel multi timbral That means you can have a different program on each channel. You can see what program is on each channel by using the channel bank buttons or the channel soft buttons. You can easily call up a specific program for a MIDI channel by going to that channel and picking the program you want. But if you have the rack, keep in mind that you may be looking at channel 2. But if you are sending from your keyboard on channel 1, you may still be hearing the program that is on channel 1. I'll show you how to change this in the next section. You can play any program on any channel, with one exception. The KB3 programs can only be played in a single MIDI channel. You choose this channel with the organ channel parameter on the master mode. If you're in a different MIDI channel and you scroll to a KB3 program, you will see it displayed in parentheses and it will not sound. Now, let's take a look at setup mode. Setup mode allows you to take up to eight programs on eight different MIDI channels and split or layer them in zones across the keyboard. If you call up a setup which uses three zones or less, 
then the left part of the display will show the programs for each zone. Lines under the program name show where each zone is laid out on the keyboard. In this setup, you can see that school bass is assigned to the left side of the keyboard, and FM-ish e-piano and Dine piano are layered on the right. You can also see the MIDI channel for each zone. If the setup has more than three zones, then you will still see the lines showing in the keyboard layout, but the program names are not displayed. Before we proceed any further, we need to talk about one parameter which will be important if you have the rack module. It's called Local Keyboard Channel, and it's found on the MIDI Receive page. To get to it, press the MIDI mode button, then the soft button labeled Receive. You will need to use this parameter if you want to use setup mode. It is important to understand that a setup is designed to transmit information. On the keyboard version of the 2600, the keyboard itself will transmit on up to eight channels when in setup mode. But with the rack, if your keyboard only sends information on one MIDI channel, you need a way to turn that information on one channel into eight channels. This is what the local keyboard channel parameter does. It takes the signal coming in one channel and turns it into different information, depending on where you are in the 2600. To demonstrate, set local keyboard channel to 1, and then send from your keyboard on channel 1. Now, go back to setup mode, and let's look at our setup again. The information coming in on channel 1 from your keyboard stays on channel 1, or is turned into channel 2 and 3, depending on where I play on the keyboard. It's important to understand that the local keyboard channel will change the way the 2600 performs in other modes as well. It changes the incoming information depending on what you have displayed in the 2600. For instance, if you're in program mode with channel 5 in the display, then the information coming in on channel 1 will be turned into channel 5, and you will hear the program assigned to channel 5. But if you turn local keyboard channel off by setting it to none, and if you send on channel 1, you will hear the program that is assigned to channel 1, even if you are looking at channel 5. Local keyboard does more than just change the MIDI channel. You will notice that the octave plus and minus soft buttons now will transpose the information. And you can even use it to change one type of MIDI controller to another. For more information on this, consult your manual. Once again, I want to point out that this parameter is normally used only by rack owners. If you have the keyboard, you should leave the local keyboard channel set to none. Now, let's take a look at some of the things you can do with the setup. I've already shown you a setup using a basic splitting and layering. Here is one of my performance setups that I use in the Rudis Morgenstein project with many different programs laid out across the keyboard and a surprise on the ribbon. For each zone in a setup, you can assign any controller to send any message you want. You can even use the same slider to send up to eight different messages by assigning a different controller number to each zone. Here is a setup which has five zones, each using the same string program, but with each zone transposed to a different octave. By assigning each slider to control volume for one zone, I can co constantly change the timbre of the string ensemble. Now let's look at some cool things you can do with the ribbons. One typical use is to, to use it to control pitch, which is the default setting when you're playing programs. But it can be used for many other things. Here I've used the big ribbon to crossfade between three different zones. I've used a different curve for each zone. One is set to crossfade, one to reverse crossfade, and the third to bump. 
So each spot on the ribbon gives a different mix of the three programs. <laughs> You can also trigger notes from the ribbon, as well as other controllers. So I can play harp arpeggios on the ribbon while playing another sound on the keyboard. Another thing you can do in a setup is control the arpeggiator. The arpeggiator takes notes that you play on the keyboard and turns them into arpeggiated patterns. In the next setup, I have one of the Latin percussion programs set to arpeggiate, which creates all different kinds of percussive grooves as I play on the keyboard. I can hold the groove with the pedal and then play notes over that groove. In this setup, I'm bringing in the volume of the arpeggiated sound with the ribbon. A setup allows you to call up a song when you select that setup. This is great for performance. You can simply call up the setup you want, and it will call up one of your songs. And at the same time, you call up the programs that you want to play live from the keyboard. At that point, you can press the dedicated play button, or if you have a rack, press the, press the left and right cursor buttons together, and the song will start playing, and you can play along with it. K2600 also contains some special groove template setups, which we created by using the ability to trigger songs from keys. You'll learn about this in the song mode section of this video. This allows you to have an automatic accompaniment pattern, which will switch keys as you play different notes with your left hand, while playing a melody with your right hand.
We hope that these examples have given you some ideas about the many capabilities that you have with setups in the 2600. In the next section, we'll show you how to build a simple setup. Let's make our own setup. It's easy to do. We're going to make a setup with two programs layered on the right side of the keyboard and another program on the left side. Go to setup 99. That's the default setup. Now press edit. When you first enter the setup editor, you'll be on the channel program page. Let's assign program number 14, which is suitcase e-piano to the first zone. Notice, it's assigned to channel 1, and the destination is set to local and MIDI. The most important thing to remember about setups is that each zone must be on a separate channel, because you can only have one program on a channel at a time. The exception to this would be if you assigned one zone to local only, and another zone to MIDI only. One other exception would be if you wanted the same program in more than one zone. For example, you could take a program and assign it to two zones, but then transpose one zone an octave up, allowing you to play the two octaves of the same sound. But more often than not, you'll want to have a separate channel for each zone. Now, we'll add another zone. Press the left More button three times till you see the new zone, and press it. Notice that the upper right-hand corner now shows that you're on zone two of two. Notice also that the 2600 automatically picked channel 2 for this zone, since it assumes that you want to use a different channel. Let's assign program number 107, big strings, flange strings, to this zone. Now the two programs are layered. Remember that we said earlier, if the program name has two different names separated by the caret character, then moving slider A will switch between the two programs. But when I move the slider, the program stays in the big string sound. This is because now that you're in the setup mode, that slider is not assigned to the correct controller number. We'll change this later. But for now, let's adjust the relative volumes of each zone. Press the Write More button three times. Then, press the Pan Volume button. On this page, we can set initial volume and pan settings. We'll set the volume of Zone 2 to 110. That will lower the strings a little bit. If you want to set the volume of zone 1, press either channel bank button. Now the display will show zone 1 of 2. You can use the pan parameter to set a pan position for each layer. This sends controller number 10 on the MIDI channel of the zone. Notice that there is both an entry value and an exit value for each function. You'll find entry and exit values on all of the other pages involving physical controllers, except for the pitch wheel. This is an extremely useful feature. This allows you to send a specific value for that controller when you enter or leave the setup. For example, let's say that in this setup we want zone 1 panned hard left. We choose a value of 0 for the entry value. Now we have set MIDI channel 1 to be panned hard left. If you were to go to a different setup, which includes channel 1, and it doesn't have an entry pan setting, it will still be panned hard left. But if we choose a value of 64 for the exit pan, then when we leave this setup, channel 1 will be back center panned. For now, we'll put the pan back in the center. Now let's create the third zone of our setup. Press the left more button until you get back to the new zone button and press it. 
Next, press the Write More button three times. And then press the Key Velocity Soft button. Since we're going to split zone three from the other two zones, I'll set the high note to B2. Next, I will switch to zone one and set it from C3 to C8. A good way to set the note range is to hold the Enter key underneath the numeric keypad, and while holding it, press the note that you'd like selected. So I'll press B2. Now I'll do the same thing for zone two. Hold the Enter key, press the note. Now, press the Channel Program button. Scroll to zone three and select program number 32, Rick and Bass. Now, press the key velocity button. Notice the low velocity and high velocity parameters. These allow you to set a range of velocities in which to trigger a zone. By using these parameters, you can create setups which switch sounds according to the velocity, or add an additional sound when you reach a certain velocity. You also see the transpose parameter. For this setup, we're going to change the bass to play an octave higher. So scroll to zone three, then highlight the transpose parameter and set it to 12 semitones. Finally, we'll set some of the physical controllers for our setup. Press the Write More button once, then press Foot Switch. Here we can assign the controller setting for the four switch pedals. The switch type allows you to set whether the pedal is momentary, which is the way a sustain pedal works, or toggle, in which case each time you press the pedal, it turns on or off and stays that way till you press the pedal again. If the switch type is set to momentary or toggle, then the destination can be any MIDI controller number. In addition, there are several special functions you can assign. For instance, you could start and stop a song advance to the next setup, transpose the song a specific amount, or even mute a zone. You can also set the pedal to trigger a specific note. Note M is momentary and only triggers the note while you are holding the pedal, while note T is a toggle, so the note stays triggered until you press the pedal again. Notice that if the switch type is set to note, then the destination parameter changes from a MIDI controller value to a note number. The on and off parameters let you set the value of the controller number, which will be sent when you turn the pedal on and off. If the pedal is set to send a note, then these parameters are the attack and release velocities that are sent. Finally, you see that just like on the volume pan page, you can set entry and exit values. You will also find these same parameters on the switch page, which is used for the two buttons above the mod wheel and pitch wheel. Remember that each zone can have a separate value for each controller. In this case, I want to use the sustain pedal to only sustain the layered sounds, not the bass. So since the default setup already has sustain assigned to pedal one, I'll scroll to zone three and set the destination to off. For the next step in creating our setup, we'll assign different sliders to control the volume for each zone. Press the slider button. This gives you access to the first four sliders. If you want to use the second four sliders, you'll find them under slider two button. Take a look at the various parameters. 
since all the continuous controllers work in a similar manner, you'll find these same parameters on the control pedal, ribbon, wheel, and pressure pages. Once again, the destination lets you choose any MIDI controller or a special function. I'm going to zone 1, and I'll set the slider B to volume. The scale parameter lets you control how sensitive the slider is to being moved. First, we'll solo this zone, zone 1, and set the scale parameter to 200%. With this, it would go from 0 to full value when you move from the bottom to only halfway up. Or, if it was set to 50%, then the slider would only get up to half of full value even when the slider was moved all the way up. I'll leave this set to 100%. The add parameter allows you to add or subtract a specific amount to the normal values of the slider. For instance, if you set this to 45, then the lowest amount the slider would go would be 45. You could use this so that you could move the slider all the way down, but still have some volume for that zone. The curve parameter allows you to change the way that the slider responds as you move it. Check the diagrams in your manual to see how the different curves really work. Finally, we once again see the entry and exit values. Now that I have zone 1 set, I'll go to zone 2 and assign volume to slider C. You can simply press 7 and enter, a little shortcut to get to volume. Keep in mind that the initial volume levels I set on the volume pan page will still be set when I first call up the setup, but then I can use the sliders to adjust volumes for the zone in real time. Also remember that for each zone, you can assign any of the sliders. So if you want to have a single slider controlling the piano and string sounds together, you can easily do that by assigning volume to the same slider in those two zones. Now let's go back to zone two and assign slider A to data. You can press 6 and enter. This is the, the default value sl for slider A when you're in program mode. Now, when you move that slider, it'll switch the string sound between big strings and flange strings. <laughs> Finally, we'll choose our effects for the setup. Press the Write More button twice. Then, press the KDFX button. The first parameter on the screen is the studio. A studio is a single object which consists of multiple effects and EQs plus signal and output routing. We'll go into great detail on the studio later in the video, but for now, I want to show you an easy way to assign different effects from the preset studios. Select studio number three. Take a look at the name. The 2600 has four separate effects buses, plus a global auxiliary effect. For all of the preset studios in the instrument, we have named them so that you can tell what the various effects are in the studio. In this studio, there's a room reverb on effects bus one, a chorus on effects bus two, and a chorus delay reverb multi-effect on effects bus 3. On effects bus 4, we have no effect assigned to it, which is indicated by the space between CDR and Hall. In our preset studios, we typically leave effects bus 4 set to no effect so that you always have one dry bus to choose from if you need it. Finally, a Hall reverb is assigned as the auxiliary effect.
Now, press the left more button three times and press the channel program soft button. Move the cursor to highlight the out parameter. Currently, it says PROG, which stands for program. This means that the output setting for each layer in a program is used. But you can override those settings from the setup, which means you can easily choose the effects for the individual programs in your setup without having to go back and edit the programs. Let's set Zone 1 to KDFX B. This will give it some chorus on the piano. Zone 2 will set to KDFX C. And that will add the chorus delay reverb to the strings. And zone 3 to KDFX A. This will assign the room reverb to the bass. Now we're ready to save our setup. Press the left more button four times. Then press name. You see the name of the original program, default setup. Let's name our setup E Piano Trio. There are two ways you can name things in the 2600. The first way is to use the numeric keypad. Each number has letters printed in green under the button. Each time you press the button, it cycles through those letters. Use the plus minus button to change from upper to lower case. The left and right arrow buttons along with the two arrow soft buttons are used to move the cursors across the screen. You can use the delete button to erase characters and insert will insert a space. The second way to name is to use your keyboard. Notice that in the upper right-hand corner, it says Keyboard Naming, and that it's turned to off. To turn it on, press the Channel Bank Up button. Now the different keys on the keyboard are assigned to different characters. If you look on your manual in Chapter 5 in the section of Saving, you'll find a chart that shows which key is assigned to which character. Pressing the Channel Bank Up button again puts keyboard naming in Advanced mode. This is described in detail in the manual. Once you get used to keyboard naming, you may find you can name items much quicker this way. So, I'll finish naming this setup by pressing the correct keys. We'll call it Trio. Once you have named the setup, press OK. Now press Save. The 2600 will choose the first blank number to save into. You can actually choose any number you want to save in. If a program already exists in the number you choose, the, the display changes to show the program in that location and asks if you want to replace it. For now, let's just save it to a blank location. You can press the plus and minus keys together under the wheel to get to the first available location. And then you can rotate back to replace by hitting them again. So let's save it to the first available, and I'll hit Save. Now I'll exit out, and it's saved. Congratulations, you've just created your first setup. We'll take a look at one more setup. Press the MIDI mode button. If the top line of the display does not say Transmit, press the Transmit Soft button. The first parameter on this page is called the Control Setup. We've already seen that you use the Setup Editor to allow you to set the various controllers to send specific messages. But what about when you're playing in program mode? The Control Setup parameter allows you to choose a setup which will determine the behavior of all the physical controllers while you're playing programs. For example, let's say you want to use a continuous controller pedal for volume control. Highlight the Control Setup parameter 
and press Edit. Now, press the Write More button once. Then, press the C pedal Soft button. Now, assign volume to the C pedal 1 destination. And you can do that by pressing 7 on the numerical keypad and pressing Enter. Now, press Exit. At this point, the 2600 takes me to the Save screen. I can rename the setup if I want, but for now, I'll just press Yes and then Save. Now, I'm returned to the Control Setup parameter, and the Kurzweil has automatically selected my new setup for the Control Setup. Now, as long as I'm playing programs, I can use my pedal for controlling volume. Unless you make your own control setup, you'll normally want to leave this parameter set to number 97, which has a setup with all the default assignments for the sliders and other controllers. If you're in program mode and your sliders or pedals or any other controllers don't seem to work correctly, check this parameter and make sure it's set to number 97 or one that you've created. If you do make your own control setup, you should remember that the preset programs have been programmed so that they respond to the specific controller numbers assigned to the sliders and other controllers in setup number 97. So, if you change those assignments, you won't have the real-time control over those things we've programmed. and other controllers in setup number 97. So, if you change those assignments, you won't have the real-time control over those things we've programmed. Ladies and gentlemen, Let's take a look at the quick access mode. This mode was designed especially for performance purposes, but it can also be useful in the studio. When you go to quick access mode, you will notice a list of 10 names. These can either be names of programs or setups. Notice that they are laid out the same way the numeric keypad is laid out. By pressing a button on the numeric keypad, you can call up the program or setup that relates to that button. So, you have immediate access to any 10 programs or setups with only one button press. This group of 10 is called a quick access bank. You can have up to 255 banks. The name and number of the bank is, is on the top line. You can use the channel bank buttons to move through the different banks. You can also go directly to a bank by pressing either the plus, minus, or the clear button on the numeric keypad. You can then type in the bank number and hit OK or Enter. Creating your own bank is simple. Just press Edit. The first parameter you see is Entry. This is the number on the numeric keypad that you will assign the program or setup to. You can scroll through each entry with the channel bank buttons. The next parameter lets you select a program or a setup. Scroll once to the left, and we'll choose Setup. Scroll back to the right, and you can choose which setup you want for this entry. And that's really all there is to it. As you can see, there are soft buttons for naming and saving the bank. The procedure is the same as before. Quick access banks are great to use if you're performing and need to be able to quickly get a specific group of programs and setups or if you're sequencing in a studio and want to be able to audition a group of similar sounding programs. You can assign them to one QA bank and then switch easily between them while you run your sequence.
Within the K2600 song mode, you'll find a full featured sequencer. For those of you who have never used a sequencer, it functions much like a tape recorder does. But instead of recording sound, it records events. When you play back the sequence, the 2600 recreates those events, and the instrument is played, just as if you were playing notes yourself in real time. And of course, since this information has been recorded digitally, you can go back and edit individual events to change your performance or fix mistakes. When you first go to song mode, you'll be on song one, new song. If you're not on that song, change to it. Let's look at the main song page. Along the bottom, you'll see a row of 16 tracks. Along with the MIDI channels assigned to those tracks, we've logically assigned track 1 to MIDI channel 1, track 2 to channel 2, etc. However, you can assign any MIDI channel you want to any track. You can even have more than one track assigned to the same channel. But keep in mind that you can only have one program on a channel at a time. So in that case, both tracks would be pl playing the same program. To record our first track, we'll set the record track to 1 and call up a bass program. We'll set the tempo to 200. Hit enter. Press the Miss Soft button. Set the record mode to linear and play mode to loop. There are different ways of recording your data, and we'll be exploring the various record modes. Linear recording is just like recording to tape. We can record as long as we want until the memory runs out. Check that count off is set to 1, and click is set to record. This will give us a one bar count off before recording starts, and we'll hear the click when recording, but not when playing back. Now, press main to get back to the main page. In the upper right hand corner, the 2600 displays the song status, which is stopped right now. Press the record button. Notice the display flashes record ready. When you hit play, the 2600 will count off four beats since we de designated a one bar count off and then begin recording. When you're done, the 2600 asks you if you want to save. You can name your song here as well. We'll go ahead and save it. Now I'm going to make some changes to the track I just recorded. First, I'm going to quantize it. Quantization is a tool which allows you to move notes forward and backwards in time so that they line up with the grid. With this technique, if you've played in something and the rhythm isn't very accurate, you can go back and make it accurate. Press Edit to go into the song editor. There are several different types of editors. When you first enter the editor, you're on the common page. This contains parameters such as tempo and time signature, which affect all tracks. Now, press Track. This brings you into the track editor. In this editor, there are a variety of functions which can be applied to a specific track for a given range of measures. The upper right-hand corner shows you which track you're currently editing. You can change tracks with the channel bank buttons. With function highlighted, scroll to quantize. Notice the boxed area on the right. This is called the region criteria window. You will find this for all track editing functions. It's where you set the range of measure that you want to edit, along with other criteria such as selecting notes in a certain key range or certain controllers. Since we have just entered the editor, it is set to edit from the beginning of the song till our current endpoint, and to edit the entire range of notes. We'll leave these parameters set at their defaults. On the left side of the page, you see the parameters specific to quantization. The quantization parameter lets you choose how much quantization applies. At 100%, the notes will be moved all the way to the grid point. 
if you choose an amount less than 100 percent, well, then the notes will be moved only partway according to the percentage. Grid lets you define the note value that you want to use. I'm going to quantize to eighth notes. You can quantize to any possible note value. A shortcut to getting eighth notes is to press 8, enter, and sixteenth notes would be 16, enter. In this case, we'll do eighths. To jump quickly through the standard values, you can also highlight the parameter and plus the plus and minus buttons. Let's go back to eighths, eight, and enter. The swing and shift parameters allow you to further change the way the notes are moved. Zero percent swing is straight time, and 100 percent produces a triplet feel. Shift lets you move the notes forward or backwards by a specific amount. Once you have set the parameters the way you want, press Go. The 2600 carries out the edit. Now we can play the song to hear the change. Just press the Play Soft button and listen to the difference. You can press Stop, and if you like what you hear, you can hit Exit and then save your changes. Hit yes and replace. For our next track, we're going to record some drums. We'll be using the loop record method. Loop record works similarly to the way you would create a pattern on a drum machine. You set a length for your loop, then each time the 2600 goes through the loop, it adds what you're playing to the previously recorded information. The length of the loop is determined by the endpoint. Our endpoint is now set at the point where we press stop on our first track. We want to set our endpoint so that we can record an exact 8-bar loop. To set a new endpoint, press the Event Soft button. First, you have to hit Edit, and then Event. The Event Editor will list every single event in the track. You can scroll through the track and change individual things, such as note numbers, velocity, and durations. You can use the wheel, you can use the arrows. This is great for fixing a wrong note or other small mistakes. As you scroll, you'll also hear the events. Notice that at the beginning of the track, you'll find program and bank changes along with initial volume and pan controller amounts. One trick I use to get to the beginning is I just hit 1-1 one, one on the numerical keypad and enter. It takes you right to the top. The 2600 creates these events when you first record the track. Scroll to the end of the track to change the endpoint. Another trick I use is I just hit a bunch of nines, 99999, nine, 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 and then hit enter, and it automatically takes you to the end. Or you can scroll using the wheel. Since I'm making an 8-bar loop, I'll scroll over one parameter and type 91000 zero, 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 and then enter. Now we've set our endpoint. When you're done, then you can exit and save. Since I've made changes to the track, the 2600 is always going to ask if you want to save it. And of course, you'll say yes and replace. Now I'll record my drum track. Set the record track to 2. You can use the channel bank buttons or scroll over to where it says record track. And call up a drum program. Go back to the Miss page and set the record mode to loop. I'm also going to set this track for input quantization. You can actually quantize during the recording process by setting the quantization parameters on this page instead of quantizing in the editor after the fact. Once again, I'm going to choose eighth notes and 100% quantization. Now, Return to the main page. Make sure that the mode is set to Merge. This way, it will add what you record each time it runs through your loop. If mode is set to Erase, then each time you record in the loop, it will replace what was there previously. If you make a mistake while recording in loop mode, you can erase an individual note by holding the Enter button and striking the note you want erased during the point in time you want to erase the note. Now I'll add 
add some percussion. No, not that. So I'll hold down enter and get rid of that on the loop. So that's gone. Now I'll add, I think it's maybe here. Ah, oh, yes. things. If you don't like it, you hold down enter. Gets rid of it. Oh, there's one more. But we can leave that. So I'll hit stop. It's a little guest appearance by the cowbell. So now we'll hit save and we've got our two tracks. Next thing I want to do is record a comping part for track three. For this part, I don't want to do input quantization, so I'll go back and set that to 0%. Also, I want to set this for unloop record mode. Unloop allows you to record a track that is longer than the original loop while it continues to loop the other tracks. So in this case, I'm going to record 16 bars. After the eighth bar, the drums and bass will loop back to the beginning while my comping part records in a linear mode for all 16 bars. One of the tricks I do is to hit stop right before the next beat, which automatically sets the end point for the proper place. Now I'll show another example of track editing. Go back into the track editor and scroll to change. To do that, we hit edit, but if you're on the program, it'll go into the program, which is a good feature. So make sure you're on something like the record track and hit edit. Hit the track button, and now we can scroll to change. This allows you to modify or scale note velocities or the values of a specific controller. We'll scale the velocities on track 3 to 80%. You can use the offset parameter to add or subtract a specific amount. When the mode parameter is set to constant, it will affect all the notes in the range equally. You can set it to a positive or negative ramp so that the change occurs gradually from the start point to the end point of your defined range. For example, you could scale back the velocities of a four-bar phrase using a negative ramp to create a decrescendo. I'll leave it on constant, and I'll hit go. The machine will think for a second, and now let's hear what it sounds like at 80%, track three. Very funky. Next, we'll record another track. So we'll exit out. We'll do a save, replace, yes. And I'll go to track four. And I'll pick a sound I want. Good. And we'll make sure that we're not quantizing, because the lead doesn't necessarily need to be. Back to main. I'll hit record. We're still in unloop mode, so I can really go on and play the lead as long as I like. So here we go. Stop trick, hit yes, replace, let's see what we got. Take the volume of the lead down a little. One neat trick is you can actually change something like volume by pressing the record button and while it's waiting to 
be recorded. Instead of just playing, I could change the volume, in this case of the lead, down to 100 and hit stop. And that puts in a new volume. So when I hit play, that's much more reasonable. I'm going to show one more example of the track editor. Hit edit, go to track, now we'll scroll the function to erase. We're going to set the events to mono pressure. If your keyboard has mono pressure and was set to transmit it, you may have recorded a lot of pressure events into your sequence. If the sounds you're playing do not utilize the pressure, then these events waste a lot of memory. So we'll get rid of them. Instead of erasing the pressure from just one track, I want to do it from all the tracks. So what you can do is press the channel bank buttons together, both of them. Give them one shot. And you can see in the top right, it says all. Now it's set to erase mono pressure. I hit go. It does it. And then we can exit out, hit yes, and mono pressure is gone. Now let's take a look at the mixer page.